Welcome back, fight fans, to episode number two of The Darker Side of Boxing. And this episode is all about Randolph Turpin, the British middleweight who created history by defeating famously Sugar Ray Robinson when Sugar Ray Robinson came over to London, a story which we'll cover in the course of this episode. But as you know, this episode is all about the darker side of these boxers' lives, these characters' lives. And our disclaimer before we get into it is always about telling you guys that there is going to be some graphic detail, there's going to be some explicit content in here, there's going to be some stories that are sourced from reputable journalists, reputable people, and it's their information that we have sourced for this episode. So if you guys are offended by any of the comments, any of the paragraphs of quotations that we've got from these journalists or any of the graphic nature of the detail of the events that occurred throughout the life of Randy Turpin then please switch it off now because this isn't the episode or the series for you but if you're a big fan of true crime and you're a big fan of boxing then of course this is the series and this is another episode for you to listen to. Randy Turpin then, we're going to go through his life and put a bit of context to who he was as an individual and we're going to put a bit of context to his boxing career. Not a lot of people speak about Randy Turpin in this generation in the 21st century. I think it's going to be really good to set a little bit of his career alight again and, and kind of do a little bit of a mini career profile within this episode. But most importantly, talk about the events that occurred outside of the ring, which have not been brought to light for a very long time. There's been very few bits of literature done on Randy Turpin's life and the events that unfolded in his life. And I'm really happy, as are you, Johnston, to bring this to life once more. I am. We are. It's a, it's a, it's an intriguing story about Randolph Turpin, uh, a.k.a. Randy Turpin, or the, the Leamington Licker, however you want to call him and he was obviously famous for beating Sugar Ray Robinson as you've mentioned and and I think many people just remember him for that I mean for me he is he, he lands in the top 10 of the greatest ever British boxers of all time for me personally on a personal note um, he's it was a fantastic fire and he gets overshadowed overlooked it was the time and how things ended for him which I think ruined his career he went from sort of like a hero to a zero and I think that's what we want to try and bring to you that that timeline and and how it worked for randolph and you can make your own assumptions at the end of the episode as to what kind of guy randolph was so we're going to take it right back to the beginning and talk about the father of randolph aldolphus turpin and his name was lionel fitzherbert turpin now he was born in 1895 and raised in georgetown british guiana now he arrived in england to fight in the first world war and was shipped to france in 1916 he returned two years later wounded after being severely gassed during the Battle of the Somme. A brutal battle that lasted from July the 1st to the 18th of November 1916. That was a joint operation between British and French forces intended to achieve a decisive victory over the Germans on the Western Front after 18 months of trench deadlock. Now the first day of the Somme was the deadliest day in British military history. Of the 57,470 British casualties, 19,240 men were killed and about 30,000 died from horrific gas attacks. The battle ended with well over 1 million casualties and 300,000 fatalities. Now, during Lionel's rehabilitation, he actually met and fell in love with his nurse, Beatrice Elizabeth Whitehouse. And her father, Tommy, was a former bare-knuckle fighter, and she was raised in Warwickshire in the West Midlands of England. Lionel and Beatrice would go on to have five children, Lionel Jr., a.k.a. Dick, Joan, John, a.k.a. Jackie, Catherine, and of course, Randolph, who was the youngest of the family, and he was born on June the 7th, 1928. Sadly, only one year after his birth, Lionel succumbed to the injuries he had sustained on the Somme, and he died in 1929 from emphysema and capillary bronchitis. He never recovered fully from the damage to his lungs after being gassed on the Somme. The gas attacks by the Germans killed 5,000 soldiers and wounded 5,000 more, including Lionel. His death left his wife Beatrice a widow and with the responsibility of raising all five children on her own. Well, horrific battle that, those uh, heroes of the Somme, absolutely tragic. And also coming to that, awful. Uh, well, the Turpins, going 
back to the Turpins, that they were the first black family to actually reside in uh, Leamington Spa, Warwickshire in England. In fact, they were the first black family to ever live anywhere in the county of Warwickshire. And that, of course, brought its own problems with the family having to deal with constant racial abuse and remarks from, well, an uneducated community who had a lack of understanding and sympathy around other ethnic backgrounds. Now, it, it wasn't easy for a white single mother to raise her five black children in such difficult surroundings, let alone find the money to feed them. Now, author of the 64-day champion, John Plimmer, described Beatrice in his book, and he said she was a strong woman who it was unwise to cross or mix it with. She never failed to give as much as she got, whether it was with a man or woman, and would often become involved in street fights, attacking any individual who insulted her or her children. There can be no doubt that Beatrice's fighting spirit had to have been an influence on her three boys' prowess later in the ring. And I think he's absolutely right. And Beatrice was, uh, she was collecting a modest war pension while working day and night to keep up with, the, with her kids uh, and keep, keep the kids together under one roof. But the inevitable eventually happened and some of the children were actually put into care or went on to live uh, with relatives for a while. Uh, thankfully, they were all reunited at their small council house in 1931 when Beatrice remarried to a man called Ernest Manley who would uh, step into the shoes of Lionel and be the kid's stepfather. Now, it wasn't easy for the family, but life was made a lot tougher for young Randolph after a swimming incident actually left him partially deaf in one ear. That was while underwater. He actually got trapped for too long and he actually burst his eardrum. If that wasn't bad enough, well, he actually nearly died from a bronchitis infection, actually turned into full-blown pneumonia in both lungs. So difficult start for young Randolph Turpin. A very difficult start. And of course, thankfully, Randolph pulled through, but because of his hearing problem and his very small frame, some have suggested that he might have been bullied while at school in nearby Warwick. Interestingly, as he moved into adult life, he became widely known as the Leamington Licker. But the nickname did not stem from the fact that he was from that town and that he was a professional boxer. The story originates from his older sister, Joan, who used to tell him he was the littlest of the family. Now, Randolph hated her making fun of his size, so he would scream back, I'm not the Lickerist. It was from that point that he adopted the new nickname, Licker, and the family would address him as Licker from then on. Now, the late Gordon Williams was a sports writer, a novelist and presenter of the documentary 64 Day Hero, A Boxer's Tale. He managed to source interviews with Randy's family for the first time in 1985 and he spoke with his sister Joan and brother Dick about what Randy was like growing up. And Joan said, he could be so lovable, he would break your arm one minute and mend it for you the next. He was that type, he would bandage it up for you after he did it. Now, we were all pretty violent. I've thrown knives and things at Dick. And that violence within the household made uh, young Randolph a lot tougher. And he went from being the little skinny kid with a hearing problem to the local street bully. And Joan, again, remembers in her words that he used to be a bully to a lot of the kids. He was always determined to be the boss. From then on, he was the king of the castle. Nothing ever got on top of him. He would kill himself rather than be beat. Well, his other sister, uh, Catherine, she didn't hesitate with her description of what Randy became, calling him, quite simply, a bully. Even if the other family members and his best mate, Morris Mancini, a.k.a. Mosh, believed his behaviour to be more of a leader or someone that could uh, look after themselves. Catherine was adamant about her assessment. I won't change my mind. If you didn't do what he wanted you to do, then he would clump you for it. Then he would squawk to our mother if you hit him back. So you get another clout. Randy's good friend, Mosh, was a former lightweight boxer who was a boyhood friend of Randy's. Together, they joined the Navy, a boxer's amateurs and professionals. They met 
when they were little kids while playing on their cancer the state. And uh, Mosh remembers the first time they met and sparred in the backyard of, of Randolph's house. He said, I knocked him over the dustbin. He got up and the next minute I was sitting in the rain drain. <laughs> and that was our first attempt at anything together. Their friendship from there blossomed from uh, uh, Mosh. He, well, he recounted uh, an unusual game that they would actually play in the garden. And he said he would stand in front of this fence gate while Randy threw knives at him. Wow. He said one day, as, as a knife came flying towards his head, he ducked. And in his own words, he said it landed right where my, my forehead would have been. It would have been the end of me had it happened again or if, had it landed. Rand, Randy, apparently, at the time, he just laughed about it. And he, and he asked if uh, if he'd stand there again. And Mosh just laughed back and said, is it bloody likely? <laughs> now, by 1940, Randolph officially started boxing at the Leamington Boys Club in Gloucester Street, Leamington, which was run by our local police inspector, John Jerry Gibbs. Now, the programme was started to keep boys off the streets and show them discipline. But since the age of just eight, Randy had fought numerous amateur bouts with his brother Jackie. They boxed in the booths at local fairs and become known as a double act called Alexander and Moses, where they fought for short change. They were a very successful team and were doing decent money when the spectators would chuck their loose change into the ring after they had performed. But it was at the local boys club where Randolph was able to demonstrate his high potential. His handler back then was Ron Stefani, and he was impressed with the club's standout boxer. He told Gordon Williams the punch he taught him, and he said, a left hook to the body, and then to the chin. But he didn't need a lot of teaching, it just seemed to come natural to him. When he went into fights, he didn't have to move around for openings, they just seemed to be there, and as soon as they were there, bang, they'd go. Now Randolph loved to box, he was always at the club working with Ron, and they built up a strong bond to the point where he was pretty much adopted by the Stefanis as surrogate parents. Ron's wife said that he was a very respectful young lad who showed excellent manners. He also showed excellent skills in the ring, topping all the great bills around the country. And Ron recalls the popularity he had built up, and he said no matter where we fought, everybody wanted him on the bill. He was such a pleasure to watch. Everybody wanted to see that sensational knockout that he was giving them all around the country. And he was just a boy. Well, in incredible power from a very young age. And during the Second World War, Randolph was he was too young to join the armed forces. So he began working as a labourer once he left school. The additional hours that he spent on the building sites helped him bulk up. And it was a perfect job for his strengthening conditioning. And then by the time he was about 15 years old, Ron and Jerry Gibbs began to recognise the enormous talent that they had on their hands. They both encouraged and supported the youngsters by guiding him through what is reported as 100 amateur contests, 95 of which Turpin won. Considering that he lost his first documented fight by decision, that record was a very accomplished record. And, and you can see why there was a lot of fuss around Rand Randolph Turpin. In 1943, the Leamington Boys Club recognised its first ever national title holder when Randy was victorious at the Junior Championships of Great Britain, competing at the People's Palace in Mile End Road, East London. Two years later, he won three national junior titles and the senior ABA Championship at Welterweight becoming the only person to have achieved such a feat in the same season and the first black boxer to win a senior ABA championship. The rules have since changed over the years, meaning that junior boxers can no longer enter the senior championships, so his achievement will never, ever be repeated. Amongst all of his success that year, Randolph, bizarrely, in a very strange, peculiar incident, swallowed a load of disinfectant after an argument with his girlfriend, Mary Stack, who he would later go on to marry. As a result, he was charged with attempted suicide, which was a criminal offence in those days. However, the incident was investigated further by police and it was judged to have been accidental and he was later released without charge. 
Now, considering that he was about 16 or 17 years old at the time and should have known better, you couldn't help but wonder what on earth was going through his mind and how on earth he managed to make such a terrible mistake. And it is still assumed within the family circle that this was an attempt at suicide. Wow, that's very early on in his his life that he's even considering that seems seems surreal to think about it, doesn't it? It seems surreal to talk about it at this stage of, of his life, knowing like what he goes on to do in his career. It's crazy to think that yeah. you know the, the slightest sort of adversity or a, an argument with his girlfriend caused him to to do that. I mean that that straight away it does scream alarm bells to you. Now the following year. In 1946, Randolph won his second senior ABA championship title at middleweight. In the same year, he also fought for Great Britain in the annual televised match against the USA and scored a first-round knockout in his fight. As soon as Randolph was old enough, he joined the Royal Navy as an assistant cook and managed to continue his boxing while in the forces. However, because he was a talented boxer, he was allowed to spend most of his time training for upcoming contests. While still in the Royal Navy, Randolph decided it was time to become a professional even though Ron and Jerry told him not to. Ron Stefani told Gordon Williams that they wanted him to stay in the Royal Navy and they said we would have him educated, send him to elocution lessons and invest all his money for him. But he said, back streets are me and back streets is where I want to remain. He was approached by many top professional managers but he decided to turn professional with George Middleton a local man who was already managing his brothers Dick and Jackie and his best pal Mosh Mancini. So it was no surprise to George when Randolph came knocking and he managed to land the most prized asset in British boxing. George spoke in an interview with Gordon Williams and he said, We had always been in touch with each other from when he was a boy of nine. He got in touch with me and said, Get me a contract ready, I want to turn pro. He was such a likeable kid and he seemed to maintain that attitude right up until the end. He was very popular, everybody liked him, and he got along well with all the other boxers in the gym. In fact, you could call him a gentleman outside of the ring. Well, Jackie Turpin would go on to be, so this is jumping to the brothers now, Jackie Turpin, he would go on to be the the least successful of the three brothers, but he did win the Midlands area featherweight title, and Dick Turpin would become the British and Empire middleweight champion and the first black boxer to fight for a British title. And the three brothers were actually labelled, and, uh, you know, you've got to remember this is uh, way back when, this is the 40s, the dark threats to British white hope. Oh, God. That racial card, once again, awful. Well, Middleton, who was a white guy, by the way, for those that, that, that aren't aware, just to make that clear, uh, many were, many white guys, uh, you know, they... they he run the show. Uh, would he would remain Randolph's manager, mentor, and close confidant throughout his whole career, and he and he really did stick by him. Uh, you can make your own assumptions at the end of this of what you thought about George Middleton. Now he made his professional debut in the end. Randolph Turpin professional debut in London on the seventeenth of September, nineteen forty six, against Gordon Griffiths in the first. Uh, it ended uh, stopping him in the first round. Now under the tutelage of George Middleton. Randolph added another 14 victories to his portfolio during the months that followed the Griffiths fight. And the sporting press christened him as the Black Panther and the Bronze Tiger. Turpin's career hit its first stumbling block when he experienced his first draw in 1947 over six rounds against a guy called Mark Hart, who was from Croydon in London. Now, after winning his next three fights inside three months, Randall fell to his first professional defeat on April 26, 1948, to the Croydon woodpecker, Albert Finch, at the Royal Albert Hall by a decision over eight rounds. With Randall Turpin in the early stages of his career and now of a record of 18-1-1, attentions turned to Randy's oldest brother, Dick Turpin. Now, he took on the New Zealander, Richard Boss Murphy for the Commonwealth middleweight title a month after Randy's first career defeat. The fight took place at Coventry Football Ground at Highfield Road and the man from Leamington Spa was crowned the Commonwealth champion after knocking out Murphy in the first round. So, you know, I think it's it's important that we do mention the brothers because they're all three of them are very successful. Obviously, Randolph was the most. 
Now back to the youngest Turpin and he did bounce back from defeat with a victory. But then on September the 21st 1948 in his first 10 rounder he lost for a second time to Frenchman Jean Stock at the Haringey Arena in London. Now during the fight with Stock Middleton's protégé was knocked down on four occasions before his team threw in the towel whilst sat on his stool. According to members of his corner the worst defeat of his short career so far was blamed on Turpin's domestic situation when his wife Mary Stack threatened to leave him and take their young son with her. Clearly not in the right frame of mind, Randolph complained to his brother Dick just prior to the first bell saying that he didn't feel like fighting. It was a bad year for the highly rated prospect and it all started before his discharge from the Navy in 1948 when he married Mary and they had a son Randolph Jr. Their marriage was pretty much doomed from the start and they ended up getting a divorce in 1953. The problems between them stemmed from the fact that they were both teenagers and still very immature. Mary believed that he was cheating on her with other women behind her back. She also said that he had a controlling personality, was short-tempered and would often use his fist to settle arguments between them. She accused him of domestic abuse when he returned from the Navy, stating that he had attacked her, hitting her with a broom handle with such force that it broke. When she cried out, don't hit me anymore, I'm expecting a baby, Randolph apparently said, well I'll soon fix that, and kicked her in the stomach while she was lying on the floor. Randolph denied these allegations, but did admit to slapping her around the face when she had sworn at him and called him names. The charges against him were dismissed, at the end of a court case around the time he fought Stock and the couple separated and he became an estranged father to Randolph Jr. But they did not divorce at this point. Did he do it? I mean, it's awful, isn't it? To think that if, if he thought she was pregnant, he's kicked her in his stomach. I mean, it, it makes you, it, it, it just does make you wonder why someone would make something like that up. I mean, look, you make your own assumptions with that, but that, it seems a bit crazy to make that up, but who knows? So four months out of the ring was what head trainer... Frank Auger and Middleton felt was needed to get their young protege to get his head right and give his training regi regime a new direction. They actually decided to bring in Arthur Batty, who devised a weight training program that consisted of 12 exercises that he felt changed the shape of the human body. A lot of people thought this was a bit far-fetched, but um, Jackie said that Randolph had total belief in Arthur Batty's methods and he said himself he said it did build him up stronger he really went right into it I think he really enjoyed training with weights around he would outdo any of us if I say did 20 he would do 40 and if someone else done 40 then he would out beat him and do 50 you could never beat him it was the perfect intervention for Randolph who went on a 12 fight winning streak which took him straight to the British middleweight title against his nemesis, Albert Finch. And in just under two years, Randy Turpin had knocked out or stopped eight and had earned a reputation as a heavy hitter in the 160-pound division. On the cusp of fulfilling his potential, he went into the biggest fight of his career so far, which took place at the Haringey Arena in London on October 17, 1950. The Croydon Woodpecker, was no match. He was absolutely blown away in five rounds, crowning Randy as the new British middleweight champion. Coincidentally, his brother Dick had actually lost to Finch in his last ever professional career fight in the summer of 1950. And jumping to Dick, Dick was the first non-white fighter to win the British title when he travelled to Villa Park in Birmingham to meet a guy called Vince Hawkins two years earlier. More than 40,000 people actually turned up in the pouring rain of Villa Park to see a grueling contest there that the oldest Turpin won on points following 15 rounds of absorbing boxing. Importantly, this was following the uh, removal of the colour bar, which was actually introduced in 1911. This was the same rule which remained in place in the wake of Winston Churchill's decision to prevent black boxers from fighting for the British titles. And the reason was down to the arrival of a certain legend, Jack Johnson, to England. And we did go through this in Jack Johnson's career profile Billy Wells was uh, supposed to fight Johnson. Uh, that was meant to be his opponent, but the protest from the church. Lord Lonsdale himself as well and powerful figures 
forced Churchill uh, to draw that colour line in Britain. So a massive, massive achievement from Randolph's brother. And I think that was a main reason why I thought to stick that in because, um, you know, it ties in with Jack Johnson as well. Now, following retirement in 1950, Dick joined his youngest brother's team and played an important role in his career. It all began when the new British middleweight champion Randy Turpin knocked out Spaniard Jose Alamo Medina in two rounds with a right to the jaw. He ended 1950 with seven straight victories, but nothing was more impressive than his win over American veteran Tommy Yarrows, who was 89-9-1. The Pennsylvanian was floored in the first round, but was saved by the bell. Boxing News wrote about this fight, and he said Yarrows made it his business to get close quarters and trap one of Turpin's arms, or both, if he could. Despite receiving more punishment in the second round, Tommy made it through to the end. The third was even, and Yaros won the fourth, and it looked as if the tide had turned with a vengeance. Turpin took charge again in the fifth and kept on top until the end. The referee disqualified the American for persistent holding midway through the eighth round. Now, a first round knockout kick-started 1951 for Randy Turpin, and it set up a fight with the Dutchman Luke Van Dam, who was 90-13-3 for the vacant EBU European middleweight title. Randolph was in no mood to give his adoring fans their money's worth, as a right to the jaw of Van Damme ended the fight in just over 40 seconds, with one of his defeats avenged. It was now time to put another one to bed, and that came on March the 19th against Jean Stock, who was unable to repeat his feat against the much-improved British and European champion. The Frenchman was shocked by the champion's newfound power, he hit the deck once in the first round, once in the second and once in the third, which resulted in his corner throwing in the towel before Stock could have come out for the sixth round. Great power there uh, from Turpin, both fans as well by the sounds of it. And and of course, uh, back in the day, there's a certain promoter that always comes up and it was uh, Jolly Jack Solomons, who uh, was the most influential promoter of his day. And he had actually already promoted a host of Randy Turpin's fights who had become a real crowd favourite obviously by the fact he's knocking people out of both hands and like all promoters they can notice a potential money spinner in the horizon and he identified the world middleweight champion Sugar Ray Robinson as that paycheck as we know we've done a career profile Sugar Ray well he embarked on that European tour of his and it began in Paris France against Kid Sedan in attendance was Salomons who approached Ray race trainer George Gainford about a title defence in London against Randolph Turpin. Ray told George, you can handle this guy and don't accept anything less than $100,000. Solomon's walked away on that deal, but the very next day he returned. Ray overheard George speaking with Jax and Jack was saying, you got me beat, I'll give you $100,000. George was more than happy, but he wanted to change the date. July 10, 1951, because Ray Robinson was fighting on the 1st of July in Turin, Italy. The forever confident Ray Robinson, well, he told George, don't worry about that day. I'll fight in Turin and everybody in England for $100,000. The contracts were agreed on the basis that Ray Robinson received a purse of $84,000 and Turpin $25,500. The rest of Robinson's agreed split would come from ticket sales. That was never going to be a problem with 18,000 tickets being sold in just three days. And that's obviously before internet stuff. You know, these, these people were queuing to get these tickets. The total gate receipt was $250,000 plus millions of glued to their wireless sets, listening to the BBC's coverage of the fight. The event, because that's exactly what it was, more than a fight, an actual a massive event. It took place at Earl's Court in Kensington, London, and the referee and sole judge was Eugene Henderson, a former worldweight professional boxer himself. There was, of course, a clause in the agreement confirmed that the if the title was to exchange hands, Turpin would have to give Robinson an immediate rematch within 90 days of the original contest which is, a, is an old agreement that they used to throw out the 90-day contract uh, agreement. So apparently, that, well, that doesn't exist anymore, but that was what it was back then. 
Now, to many British people, Robinson was like a film star, and when he finally arrived in London for the Turpin fight, the world champion stayed at the Star and Garter Hotel in Windsor, where crowds gathered to try and catch a glimpse of the boxing icon. He was followed everywhere and required a police escort. Now, going back to George Middleton, he knew of how much of an uphill challenge this was going to be for his fighter, and everyone had that same feeling. Some even thought that Turpin would get hurt. George Middleton did recall, Robinson didn't give Randolph a chance, nor did 95% of the population. The press were ready to tear me up into little bits. They had a script already done, because they thought Robinson was a superstar. Now, to get Randolph ready for the fight of his life, Frank Algar moved their training camp from the old gelatine factory where all of Middleton's fighters trained to Gerwick Castle in Abigail, North Wales, which is ironically currently hosting the latest series of I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. <laughs> now, a purposefully built outdoor gym was erected for his use on the front lawn of the castle by the owner, Leslie T. Saltz. Now, while Randolph went through his workouts with every ounce of determination and motivation in his body, hundreds of fans and tourists looked on. One of the sparring partners was heavyweight Derek Wheel, who described Turpin in the ring as murderous. And he continued by saying, He was a tradesman in every aspect of the sport. He didn't put you away completely, but he would give you a good hiding. When you made mistakes, you'd get knocked about. Wheel admitted to losing teeth, during the brutal sparring sessions, and even showed Gordon Williams the proof. It was Gordon Williams who actually tracked down Leslie T. Salts during the making of his documentary, so he could discuss the exploitation that Randall suffered at the hands of money-grabbing white men, which obviously included himself. When asked how many would attend the castle to see Randolph train for the Ray Robinson fight, Salts said ten to 15,000 after the first fight. There was quite a few more before that, in that first fight as well. He went on to say, we never counted anything. I think what Gordon Williams was trying to point out was the fact that thousands had attended the castle to pay and paid entry and Salts would take all the profit. Randolph had seen nothing. Randolph was not paid a single penny. Salts confirmed that the arrangement was, in his own words, Randolph and his sparring partners to stay at the castle rent-free and not have to pay for anything. It didn't matter what they required, they were our guests. Now, considering they've got hundreds of thousands, God knows how much he's asking for a ticket. This should have, Randall should be getting some money here. Golden Williams asked sparring partner Derek Will uh, what he thought Randall should have been earning. And he said, I would say he should have been paid 500 quid a week. And that's just appearance money at the castle. He then went on to say that the people around him knew what they got off of Randolph Turpin and they must all carry the blame. As we would say, he was the jewel in the crown. He was a money earner from the word go. He was the Messiah. He couldn't go wrong. He was signing autographs to the thousands. Everybody was getting a meal on him. So Randolph was so blinded by the big castle the sharks that surrounded him, they got close, as as Salts did. Salts got close to him, just like he had done with George Middle. I mean, he actually agreed for Leslie Salts to become his business manager. George asked, was asked about why he allowed Salts to be brought into the equation. And he said to Gordon uh, Williams, he said, Mr. Salts talked him into becoming a business manager and Randolph stood for it. With the Turpins, Dick, Randolph and Jackie, you could advise them. And they would listen to you, but you couldn't tell them what to do. But you couldn't tell them to do this and you couldn't tell them to do that. You couldn't pick their friends for them. Now, in contrast to Randolph, who was working his ass off in training, Sugar Ray Robinson, who was accompanied by a photographer, Gordon Parks, Gordon Parks was saying that there were no workouts going on and that Sugar Ray was just playing golf through the day and he was at the card tables late into the nights. At the weigh-in, it was the challenge of Turpin who was aged 24, came in who was slightly heavier at £158, and the champion, aged 30, recorded £154. Two days before the fight, a tragic story developed about a seven-year-old little girl called Christine Vivian Butcher, who was a massive fan of Sugar Ray Robinson. 
Having seen the crowds gathering outside her idol's hotel, she told her mother she was going to show her doll to the champ in the hope that he would be so impressed he might give her a ride in his pink Cadillac. Now it was said that when she heard that Sugar Ray Robinson, the boxer, had arrived in Windsor to train for his upcoming fight with Randy Turpin, she decided to go and show him that doll. The hotel that he was staying at, the Star and Garter Hotel, was only 30 yards away from where she lived. Her mother waved her off at 3.30pm on Sunday the 8th of July. However, Christine Butcher never made it, and neither Sugar Ray Robinson nor the hotel staff ever saw her. As a result of the fame attached to Ray Robinson, the story of the missing girl was actually broadcast around the world. When Ray found out about the news, he did make a brief statement to the world press saying, I'm very sorry about this. If I'd known she wanted to see me, her daddy could have brought her in, and then this would never have happened. Well, the uh, story took a horrific turn on the day of the fight, July 10, 1951, when two members of the public stumbled across Christine Vivian Butcher laying in some long grass close to Windsor Castle. An immediate investigation revealed that she had been brutally raped and strangled to death with the belt of her raincoat, her doll and her bag of sweets she had been carrying were found nearby. The gruesome and horrendous find sparked a murder investigation that appalled not only the population of Great Britain, but the countries far beyond resulting from the incident's bizarre association with the Randolph Turpin and Sugar Ray Robinson fight. Her inquest actually took place on Friday, 21st September 1951, uh, returned a verdict of uh, murder by some person or persons unknown. The main suspect was a white man who wore like a great suit and others, others suggested that uh, she was seen in the park sitting on the bench uh, with two identified strangers. I mean, her murder remains unsolved to this day and I know this is not about Randy Turpin. I understand that. But this is a part of the biggest fight of his career against Sugar Ray Robinson. And it, we had to mention it. It's a story that just just gets swept away. No one ever knows about it. So, you know, for the listeners, you know, it's important that this comes to light. It, it's a dark side of boxing. It was a really dark murder. And it was horrific to think that this young seven-year-old girl was murdered on the day of this fight. I can't even bear to think about it. I've got a daughter it's of a awful. similar age and... Uh, I wouldn't have, have, have let my daughter go, even if it was only 30 yards away, I wouldn't have let her go off on her own. But again, this is a completely different period of time. You know, the society was totally different back then. So you probably wasn't expecting to let your daughter go out and never see her again. You know, it was it was completely different society back then. But it, absolutely horrific. And it's bizarre, isn't it, how it is linked to this particular fight because of how much of a fan of Sugar Ray Robinson she was. Because as we've rightly pointed out, he was like the film star to the English when he came over. He was he was the he was like the Sinatra, you know, he was like coming over and he was this big superstar and you know this this poor little girl ended up getting raped and murdered uh, as a result of wanting to go and see Sugar Ray Robinson and, and, and being made to you know go to to the place where he was at. I, I, it, it does it. It's quite upsetting to be honest. It's uh, it's quite a horrific incident that's occurred and like you said, Johnson, it's right to put it into the episode, even though it's not directly linked to Randy Turpin, it's linked to the fights because she wanted to see Sugar Ray Robinson, of course. Uh, but going back to the fight, and if you ever wanted a comparison to the different leagues these two actually fought at, then this is probably a good example of how these two differed. On the day of the fight, Sugar Ray Robinson arrived in his pink Cadillac at Earl's Court with his usual entourage and was greeted by loyal fans. At the same time, and in contrast, Randy Turpin travelled to the venue via the tube with his manager George Middleton, accepting the best wishes from the other users on the underground. This was the seventh and final fight of Robinson's European tour. The other six fights were non-title affairs, which took place in France, Switzerland, Belgium, Germany and Italy between May the 21st and July the 1st. Well, on to the fight, and uh, we are... Going to use quotes from Randall's brothers and George Middleton on how the fight went, rather than just put a, um, a report of. So Jackie explained his brother's tactics. He said every move Robinson made, he, as in Randy, made a move. Not a counter, but exactly the same. If Robinson came down, he came down with him. And when Robinson came down, 
He stayed down and moved in on him. I think they expected him to back off and try and cover up all the time, but he did just the opposite. Dick smiled wide as he explained how his little brother was picking on Robinson and putting him where he wanted him to. They called him a bully. He bullied him. In round seven, Turpin opened a cut over Robinson's eye and by round 10, he was in complete control on the verge of defeating the unbeatable. George Middleton recalled the moment he spoke to his fighter just before the last round. At the 14th round, I jumped up in the corner and I said to Randolph, take things steady, watch what you're doing and keep moving backwards because you are the new middleweight champion of the world, he said. Randolph Turpin replied, not yet, George. We've got another one more round to go. Turpin held on and went on to take the fight convincingly. Referee Eugene Henderson was the sole judge. With the fight concluded, he raised Turpin's hand in victory and the crowd went wild. I mean, that went absolutely berserk. They were singing songs. It's it's a fantastic ending to that. His uh, score was not announced, uh, but the Associated Press scored the fight 9-4-2 for Turpin. Dick obviously was overwhelmed, his brother, saying it was bloody marvellous it was. I couldn't even get into the ring. I was crying. I was so proud. My baby brother had done it. After losing his title, Sugar Ray Robinson, being the gentleman was, he confessed he got beaten by the better man, admitting I have no alibis. He later described Turpin at a press conference as a fighter, one of the best I've ever met as a fella. He's a wonderful fella and one of the most regular guys you will want to meet. Randy Turpin, middleweight champion, on top of the world, beating the seemingly unbeatable Sugar Ray Robinson. What an unbelievable moment this was for him in his life. And the reason why he goes down in British boxing folklore and one of the biggest upsets in boxing history. Of course, we've we've covered this in in one of our previous episodes about British boxers and and winning world titles, biggest upsets. It's, It's another one. It's just one of them upsets that will always live forever and and you know it's episodes like this that we cover and Sugar Ray Robinson's career that we've done where we've brought him back to life a little bit again and and it's great that at this point in his life after all the adversity he has gone through so far that he was able to win the world middleweight crown now two days after the fight Turpin returned home to Leamington Spa to be welcomed by thousands lying in the street of Warwick and Leamington the new world champion sat waving from the back of an open car flanked on either side by the mayors of both towns, each laying claim to the victor. Newsreel cameras rolled, and a host of photographers' cameras flashed in rapid succession as the recently crowned world champion appeared on the balcony of the town hall. A bouquet of flowers was presented to the new idol by his three-year-old son, Randolph Jr., and his mother, Beatrice, who was partially blind at the time, and was proudly led by George Middleton to join her now-famous son, All heads turned skywards as a vampire jet from the 65th Squadron at the RAF Honley performed a victory roll overhead. Both mother and son stood above a huge banner that read Royal Leamington Spa welcomes their champion Randolph Turpin. And the whole scene was one of great festivity and exhilaration. And Randy did say some words that day. And this is what he said. He said, it was a great fight on Tuesday. And I'm very proud to bring back the middleweight championship of the world back to England, Warwickshire. I must tell you how grateful I am to my manager, my trainer and my family and many others who have helped me so much throughout my career. I'm not much at making speeches but any of you will know what I mean in my own language. Now the return fight took place a mere 64 days after the first encounter at Earl's Court and Turpin was quickly back in training at the castle in North Wales to prepare for his first defence of the title against Sugar Ray. What a welcoming, eh? what a welcome back that was. Uh, RAF pilots, you know, doing rollers, uh, rolls and everything. Unreal, unbelievable. Well, Randolph was quietly confident uh, of defeating Ray Robinson in the rematch, uh, saying to an American reporter on his arrival, I think it will be the same as Earl's Colt. Quite simply, I'm going to beat him again. Dick remembers their arrival in New York. When we left the boat and we got to our hotel, there was a very well-dressed lady and a smartly dressed young lady there. They said they were there to welcome them to New York. 
that lady was a lady called Adele Daniels from Harlem. And George recalls there being three ladies who invited them all to a breakfast party. And he said, Randolph wanted to go, so we all went. He took to her and they just carried on from there. Adele and Randolph began a short relationship, even though George warned him from the dangers of becoming involved. But the manager's pearls of wisdom were ignored yet again. It was later alleged that Randolph had promised to marry her and take her back to England with him, but that just never tra- transpired. While Randolph was enjoying his newfound fame in his first visit to America, promoter Jack Solomons was consolidating his with his contacts in the States. Now, he actually told a reporter that getting fights in America for British fighters meant dealing and playing with the mafia, who still, what he said, controlled boxing. So, well, he was actually present as well in the in the rematch in America, and he was present during his get-togethers with uh, Jack Solomon's, and he recalled, and this is what he said in his own words, I only went there to advise him, as in Randolph Turpin, if there was anything going wrong. And when I got there, I found that as soon as I started to put things to his manager and Solomon's, they said it was nothing to do with you. This is management. And so they took over with the Americans. Saltz then suggested that Solomon's and the Americans had become really close during their time in New York. And he went on to say they weren't going to fall out because they were prepared to do anything, anything at all, as long as they got what they wanted. They were very tough people. Gordon Williams asked if he was threatened and Saltz took a long time to reply before saying, I wouldn't like to answer that. Perhaps I've given you the answer. Now, although Saltz exploited Randolph just as much as anybody else, but Solomons and the Americans who had ties with the mob manipulated their way into earning the most money from the fight. you just got to look at the money Solomons earned from the two fights alone. Gordon Williams confirmed... For the first championship fight, Turpin earned £11,000. Promoter Jack Solomons, he took £38,000. When he was in New York as the champion, Randolph grossed £70,000. And the promoters, £122,000. Now, although the recorded earnings were Turpin's share at 25%, approximately $210,000, and Robinson's share was 30%, approximately $230,000, A crowd of 61,000 gathered at the polo grounds in New York, which produced a gate of $767,630. And there were movie rights that were involved at $200,000 and then theatre television rights, which were $25,000, to watch the British champion's first title defence against their favourite son. Robinson opened as a 12-5 betting favourite, but the odds were actually slashed to to 2-1 the day before the fight. On this occasion... When Ray Robinson arrived at the stadium for the event, there was no pink Cadillacs or large entourages. He was more focused this time, and he was not going to underrate Randy Turpin once more. Well, once again, the fight was a close fight, with Randy Turpin winning rounds eight and nine on all three scorecards. At that point, it was tight, and then he's nicked sort of eight and nine, and it's heading in his direction. He actually opens a bad gash over Robinson's left eye in the tenth. And as we've said in Robinson's uh, career profile, this, this cut was, was a big impact in his fight. Robinson did drop Turpin with a right hand that he threw in desperation in the 10th after referee Ruby Goldstein issued a warning to him during the break between rounds that he would stop the fight after that round because of the severity of the cut. He had to get rid of him. After getting up on a count of nine, Turpin was stuck against the ropes while Robinson threw shot after shot, frantically looking for the finish before the round ended. Thankfully, or for Sugar Ray Robinson in a way, Ruby Goldstein stopped the fight to the dismay of the Leamington Spa faithful who still believe many feel that their hero was robbed. Randolph claimed that the referee's decision to stop the fight, he said, I was rolling the punches. Uh, The referee, um, there were only seconds remaining. I didn't want to go down because I knew that would end it. He then later said that the referee should not have stopped it. I was perfectly keen. There were only eight seconds to go in the round and I was covering up. 
uh, Robinson said after the fight that after my uh, after my eye, my eye was cut, uh, it was basically do or die. I didn't want to take any chances of the referee stopping the fight. Just before Randolph boarded that boat home to England, he addressed reporters, American reporters, and once again he said to my people back home and all the British people, I would like you to know that I did my best, but this time my best wasn't quite good enough. And to be fair, look, he was riding them shots. I probably he probably could have survived it. I'm sort of with the Lehman and Spa a lot. Where I don't wouldn't say he's robbed. I think it went in Robinson's favour because he was the home fighter. But I think if the, if it had gone another round, I think Robinson would have got rid of him. But following the defeat at the Parallel Grounds in New York, Randolph returned home without much fuss from the British public, and he also lost touch with his uh, little fling, Adele Daniels. Now, the money from the rematch earned Randolph about half a million pounds in today's currency and should have made him for life, really. Should have had him set up for life. Now, when Gordon asked George Middleton about how Randolph was with money, he said, he got it, spent it. He said money was to spend. I couldn't make him understand. His sister Joan remembers how reckless he became with money and she said, He would come into the room and he would empty his pockets, roll money up and throw it into the air like snow. He came in one night and he had money all over him and he kept saying, count this Joan and he was throwing it all about. Me and Jack counted it and there was about £17,000. He did invest in a large house that he shared with his sister Joan and her husband John, his brother Dick and his kids and best friend Mosh and his wife. Must have been a very busy household. (laughs) <laughs> but he preferred staying in Wales because the people always thought of him as a champion and not that mixed race kid from the back streets in Warwick. Now after making a winning return to the ring, a 7th round knockout of Alex Buxton, Randolph continued to train at the castle. He was getting himself prepared for when Ray Robinson retired from the sport after the legendary middleweight champion refused to give him a third fight. The aim was to bide his time and then make her another assault on the world middleweight title. During a training session, where fans still gathered to watch him train, he met the daughter of a Welsh farmer, Gwyneth Price, who attended the castle regularly to watch him train and spar. She plucked up the courage one day to ask him for an autograph, and they hit it off from there, and they ended up becoming an item. So Randolph then decided to go into business with uh, his partner, his business partner, Leslie Saltz, and they purchased the Great Orms Head Hotel in Landudno in Wales, even though he was advised by his family and George Middleton not to. They went halves on the business venture, uh, 7,500 quid each. Jones said, he bought it in a way in spite of me, Dick and George. I went up there with my then husband, John, to run the place. I looked after the cafe and, and John looked after the bar. Together, Joan and her husband at the time, it was John Beston, Without any previous experience, actually made a success of it. They were making good profits and fans flocked to the hotel in their thousands. But it wasn't long before the hotel began to lose profit. Gerald Williams actually was a former Coca-Cola delivery boy at the hotel and he remembers why. And he said every time he, as in Randolph Turpin, would go back to Leamington, he would come back with different people. And half of them were bums or only hangers on there would be a different face every time. There were dozens like that. They were all getting into him. You always sensed that there was a fiddle going on. And that's the reason why I got on the fiddle myself to earn a few bob. And he used to just sort of probably pretend to sell a few more Coca-Cola bottles than he should have. Well, Leslie Saltz, obviously, he noticed that the place was going under. And, uh, well, that selfish piece of shit, because that's basically what he was, like a lot of them were. He left the partnership, leaving Randolph to manage it On his own. The business quickly became a strain on the former boxer's resources. And he actually tried. He actually tried to get his brother-in-law, John, to go back with him after he and Joan had actually left the hotel in disarray. Because obviously at the end of it, they've just they've they've done their job and then it fell apart. Um, he actually blamed John as well for the reason, which wasn't John, it was it was another of it was him as well as Leslie. They run it into the ground basically. Well, Gwen remembers Randolph telling John to go back with him and that to do some work on it. And he wouldn't pay him for it either. He was going to give him a penny. Well, Johnny refused, rightly so, and basically got a right-hander for it. John told John Gordon that he uh, busted me nose. 
Uh, Randolph returned to Gwen and he said, I nearly killed, I nearly killed Johnny Best on tonight. And had it not been for Joan, he would have done. Uh, he did feel guilty about it. Sad, isn't it? I'm sad that how, how that type of fame and the uh, the clingers on that come with it probably were talking a lot in his ear, probably convincing him to do what he was doing, and which is probably why the business went down the swanny. Wouldn't surprise me in the slightest because these things do happen with these types of investments. Leslie Saltz, we kind of always knew he was a bit of a shit and, and that just kind of <laughs> yeah. solidified the fact that he was obviously being a shit and he decided to, to bail out on it after he'd uh, bled it dry along with, with Randy Turpin himself. Now, in the end, he eventually sold it in 1962 for a substantial loss prior to the former champion being declared bankrupt. But that wasn't going to be the end of his problems. And unfortunately, there was more financial pain to come his way. So he did what he knew best. He continued fighting to earn money. He won the British and vacant Commonwealth light heavyweight titles against Don Cockell. Then the vacant Commonwealth middleweight title against George Angelo. And the vacant EBU middleweight title against Charles Humez. From April 1952 to June 1953. Those victories put him in position to fight for the vacant ring world middleweight title against Carl Bobo Olsen, who was 58-6, and at Madison Square Garden in New York. But before the fight, things began to go a little bit pear-shaped. Randolph had earned a reputation for being a bit of a playboy and a womaniser when at the height of his career, and having been named previously by a husband alleging that he had committed adultery with his wife. On top of that, the Jet magazine ran an article headlined on April the 9th, 1953, Randy Turpin's wife seeks divorce in London. The printed section of that article read, British middleweight champion Randy Turpin's white wife, Mary Theresa, sued for a judicial separation in a London divorce court. On the grounds of cruelty, Turpin, number one challenger for the vacant middleweight title, denied the charge. The Turpins, who have been separated for several years, have one child. Now, as soon as Turpin arrived in New York, Adele Daniels, who we mentioned earlier, well, she was back on the scene. And the lady soon made her presence known by hanging around his hotel and causing various scenes that were disruptive to the former champion's training schedule. His brother Dick said that he would lock himself in his room and spend more time riding horses and only train in bursts. Randolph then made the following statement to the press before the fight and he said, They say I haven't trained hard enough for this fight. Who is to be the judge of how hard I work? I have worked hard, all right. Harder than most people think. Well, when it came to the fight, Randolph was not in a good place mentally and he was, uh, due to the lack of training, it, it cost him another chance of glory. He went down uh, in the ninth and the tenth rounds, but survived the full 15 and lost by a unanimous decision. Randolph Turpin finally broke his silence after the fight. He said, if I had been in my natural mental state, I would have stopped him about the eighth round. But I've had so many personal problems recently, I wasn't myself. Well, after the defeat to Olsen, there was a complaint. It was made by Adele Daniels that her former lover, as in Randolph Turpin, that he had raped her and beaten her up. Randolph Turpin was arrested and detained by the police in relation to the allegations she made, and he, of course, denied everything. He claimed that Daniels was seeking retribution for his failing to fulfil his promise to take her back to England with him. His explanation, well, it carried no weight, and his contribution to the world of boxing well, it meant nothing, and especially in America. Randolph Turpin was charged and sent for trial in New York. In the middle of the final hearing, and much to the professional boxer's relief, the complaining woman, well, she dropped all the charges, but that wasn't the end of the misery, uh, whether justified or not. Adele Daniels then took out a civil action for $10,000 in damages to be paid as compensation for his failed promise to, of marriage. Now, how the hell she managed to make up that bullshit and then come back and say that, actually, I'm going to sue you for failed marriage is incredible that they even allowed that to happen. But it did. 
that action remained hanging over Turpin until actually 1955, uh, when she actually finally agreed to settle out of court, and I bet she did for the total sum of a measly 3,500. And um, even George Middleton called that cigarette change for Randy at this time, even at this time. Now, a measly sum was compared uh, to, to the size of the legal cost that Randolph incurred, which I believe was around 7000 as well. So he had to cough up anything. But basically, it looked like about $10,000, uh, which are probably about six grand in, in English money, uh, maybe a little bit more than that. He blamed that. He actually blamed his brother, Dick. Uh, Dick even said that he said, this is your fault when he got nicked for, for talking to Adele Daniels about his previous marriage. Uh, he actually, because he disclosed the, the details of what happened with Mary Stack. And it did have similar lines, like guidelines from the things she said. It did sort of match with what Mary said and, you know, the divorce thing come out. Well, sadly, a rift developed between the two brothers and Dick Turpin left his camp. And this is the evil things that some women do. And I'm telling you now, this Adele Daniels, like, at the start of the story, when you hear about her, she sounds like, you know, a really attractive woman who, who's caught his yep. eye, who it looks like, you know, maybe something will come of it. Because he didn't take her back to England, she's waited and waited for that chance. And as soon as he's turned up over there, knowing that he's going to be involved in a big fight over there, she's thinking, I'm going to take this fucker for everything I can get. And that's exactly what she tried to do. That's exactly yep. what she tried to do, but she didn't get there in the end. I mean, she got a measly sum compared to what she actually wanted, but it's not the point. Randy Turpin's legal expenses were a lot higher. So he's incurring all these legal expenses, he's getting put on trial, and then she decides to drop the charges, settle out of court, take the money in. It's, it's these types of things that make you wonder, like, how can certain people be believed? It, it tars people with the same brush. You know, yeah. people start accusing a lot of other people. Um, you know, if it was a woman accusing a man of raping raping them, it then tars the real genuine women who have actually been raped as a result of people like this doing that, which is, is shocking. But she's obviously seen an opportunity there. Absolute piece of shit in my eyes for, for doing that. And poor, poor Andy Turpin, you know, as a result of, of that, he ends up losing his relationship with his brother because obviously... Dick, in conversation at some point along the line, must have mentioned Mary Stack and must have mentioned, you know, yeah, he, he was he was married before and he had a bit of a fisty cuffs and blah, blah, blah. She's definitely took all that on board and she's definitely used that, 100%. Uh, another scumbag in his life, unfortunately for him. Now, when he returned home, he married Gwen in 1953 and they would go on to have four daughters, Gwyneth, Annette, Charmaine and Carmen. Unfortunately, Gwen wasn't the only woman her husband had relations with, not helping himself here again. And there were several occasions when the courts had to deal with various allegations made against him. His rift with Dick was not only the divide in his life. He fell out with Joan as well. And she said, he asked me if I liked her as in Gwen. So I said, do you want me to tell you the truth or tell you a lie? And he said, I want you to tell me the truth. And I said, no, I don't like a Randolph. So that was me out as well. Fortunately, time was still on his side as far as the ageing process of being a professional boxer was concerned. But there was little doubt he had left something of himself behind in that ring in Madison Square Garden from the devastating beating he received at the hands of Carl Bobo Olsen. He was never the same man again. In May of 1954, Turpin travelled to Rome in Italy to make his first defence of his EBU middleweight title against Tiberio Mitri, who was 64, 4 and 6. But it was to end in more disappointment. The Italian wasted little time in causing a major and unexpected upset when he knocked out Randolph in 65 seconds of the opening round. The challenger caught the champion with a left hook which floored him with some assistance from what many alleged was a push. Ironically, the Englishman fell heavily and hit the back of his head on the ring floor. He managed to get back to his feet but then collapsed onto the ropes causing the referee to stop the fight. Local journalist and author of The Tragedy of Randolph Turpin, Jack Bertley, said that Randolph should not have been fighting. And he said Turpin took too much punishment. There's no doubt about it. He had double vision from the Mitri fight. His reflexes were bad. His eyes were out of alignment. And he should have stopped. And he should have been stopped from fighting. He went on to say that boxers are just walking cash registers. And that comment probably still stands today. 
Absolutely spot on. It really is. They really were walking cash registers. And he did mention Freddie Mills as another that that they just continue to fight when um and when these people are earning money from them, they're just going to allow it to keep happening. And he also blamed the British Boxing Board of Control for not stepping in and stopping him from fighting. But you know, when money's involved, the health issues just don't tend to matter, especially back then. So against all advice to stop fighting, Randolph Turpin obviously decided to carry on, and uh, that. The time was right for him as well to move up to light heavyweight, even though he lost his size advantage that he carried in that middleweight division. You know, he was always quite, he was bigger than many middleweights and he obviously lost that. And of course, back in the 50s, there was no super middleweight category. So his opponents were a lot bigger than he was and they hit a lot harder. And that's not the type of situation you want to be in if you've already got blurred vision, um, you know, you're, 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 your eyes are out of alignment. Uh, it, it's not not the way to go. Rumours surfaced among the British fans at the time as well that his move up to the £175 division was because he wanted to get a world title shot against another legend in Archie Moore, but that never came to fruition. Instead, he kept his short-term aim of fighting on the domestic front. In 1955, Turpin beat Alex Buxton again by a technical knockout in Leicester to take the British and the Commonwealth light heavyweight titles. However, Turpin's most recent success didn't last long. And in October of that year, he faced an unknown Canadian dock worker called Gordon Wallace. He went to the canvas four times, as in Randolph Turpin hit the canvas four times before being knocked out in the fourth round. The Prime Minister at the time, Winston Churchill, actually retired in 1955 at the ripe age of 80 due to ill health. As did Randolph Turpin at the age of 27 following... The Wallace disaster. The Leamington liquor had finally recognised the scales had been against him and it was time to hang up his gloves, or so people thought. In less than 12 months after his first retirement, he returned to the ring. How many times have you heard this? Claiming that he had left, he had left too early uh, to the disbelief of many cynics. In 1956, he beat a guy called Alessandro Ottavio. By a technical knockout at the Embassy Sports Drome in Birmingham. Then he knocked out a gasket bro uh, at a Perry Bar Stadium. And then he fought a guy called Hans Stretz in Germany and lost on points. But before the end of the year, he fought Alex Buxton again a third time on another technical knockout in Leicester to win the vacant British light heavyweight title. So he's still winning on the domestic scene, even though he's on the decline. He did make one defence of that title and then run off a sequence of six wins on the bounce, five by stoppage in 1957 to the summer of 1958. Just goes to show how good of a fighter he was, really. Yeah, obviously, when it he really was... really does, doesn't it? When he was stepping up to back to that yep. world level, he was getting beat because he was declining. But when he was back on the domestic scene, he beat Alex Buxton again for a third time, winning the British light heavyweight title. It just goes to show you how good of a fighter he was. That that just, again, proves it once more to me. Now, his next scheduled bout was against the American, Willie Pastrano, but that was derailed by the British Boxing Board of Control because... They were not comfortable with the idea of Turpin fighting a much younger and stronger man and thought he would get seriously injured, so they refused to sanction the fight. His last proper professional boxing contest was against Yolandi Pompey, who was 33, 6 and 4, in 1958, a 29-year-old from Trinidad and Tobago. The fight took place at the Perry Bar Stadium in Birmingham, and Turpin was knocked out by the Trinidadian with an explosive right-hand punch. The Nevada State Journal wrote about this fight and they said, Pompey KO'd the former world middleweight champion at 1 minute 30 seconds of the second round after himself being put down on one knee momentarily in the first session. Turpin boxed confidently, perhaps overconfidently, until a left hook followed by a terrific right put him flat on his back. Now following the defeat, Randolph was adamant that he could continue, but his persistent eye problems and partial deafness was the inevitable final nail in the coffin, so he officially called a day on his boxing career and hung up his gloves. The sport that he loved, and had earned him hero status, was now over. It was estimated from accounts kept by his manager George Middleton that during his career in the ring, Turpin had grossed a total in the region of £300,000, a figure that would be equivalent to around about £4 million today. But... He was flat broke, because all of them sharks around him, at the height of his career, well, they'd sponged from him. And now, at this point, they were nowhere to be seen, of course. 
Turpin's philosophy on money about it's there to be spent, it backfired on him massively. And all the so-called friends and hangers on that borrowed or took money from him, as I said, they disappeared. It's just incredible. I mean, he ended his career as well. Just to, He had another couple of fights, which we haven't really mentioned, but he ended his career 66 wins, uh, eight defeats, one draw, 45 by way of KO. But as, as you said earlier, Sean, it, it, the fact that he's fighting on the domestic front and he's knocking out decent decent fighters, uh, it's just when he went to the top, top world level that at this point of his career, was just he, he just got busted. But in saying that, Bobo Rosen had so much going on in his head and he was suffering with depression. No one actually said it. But when you look at it, it, he locked himself away. He was riding horses. He wasn't training. And and everyone kept saying, I don't know what your problem is. Everyone just assumed it was maybe that it was Adele Daniels. With all that crap, he was really suffering. Um, and I think that point when he was that young boy and he tried, he swallowed that disinfectant. I think that was that that's come back on him now. And I honestly believe that he was in a real bad, bad situation. Now, his wife, Gwen, said... Uh, how he gave um, this was this is the type again she's just explaining what he would do with all these these guys that were just around him he actually gave a guy three thousand dollars for safekeeping but when he went to get that money back the guy told him that he had spent it but he didn't do anything Randy didn't do anything he beat him up he didn't demand it he just left it I mean why did he do that I mean we'll get into that in a minute but it's crazy there were plenty of other people like this that surrounded him in his life that he, he he stupidly trusted. Now, his failure to assess or judge the true characters of individuals eventually proved to be his Achilles heel. So instead, Randolph had only memories and empty pockets. He then opted to buy a shabby small transport cafe in Leamington's Russell, Russell Street, calling it off, uh, after his wife, Gwen's Caff. Gwen uh, actually wanted him to keep the hotel. Obviously, we said he sold, he sold that in 62, but he went against that idea. And even his estranged sister now at the time, Joan, she said um, in her own way, she, she said that he was advised not to buy it, but he bought it anyway. That man, he bought it off, must have known it was condemned. I mean, the, the building's condemned and he's still buying it. Crazy. The final insult from the boxing gods came when he, he was when he, he was prevented from being a sparring partner for Terry Downs in 1961 by the British Boxing Board of Control again. Uh, again, the reasons were the same as the previous, why they didn't want him to fight before uh, physical health, considering the punishment he had suffered during his boxing career. And at the age of 30, Randolph was desperate for money. So what did he do? He went to work on a scrapyard for a guy called Bertie Harrison, I believe George Middleton was the guy who hooked him up with this. Together, they enjoyed many nights out. They'd go to London in the weekends and just get drunk and mess around with girls. But Randolph was struggling mentally. They didn't ever, again, it was never a thing. I mean, back then, you don't talk about this kind of thing. Randolph was just keeping his inner demons in with himself. And his depressive state was becoming more regular. He needed a way of making more money. So what did he do? He moved into wrestling so uh, he could support his wife and four daughters. Well, at first, it was a very successful move and the crowds were happy to pay and see the man who beat Sugar Ray Robinson. But the novelty wore off very quickly and he went from earning, he went from earning £100 a match to £25. He fell into the same trap as before and continued to live the high life when he should have been putting it away for the future. He was exploited yet again by hangers-on and spent more than he was bringing in. To rub more salt into the wounds... The Inland Revenue sent him a tax bill for £100,000, a figure based on what they had assessed was owed to them based on his previous earnings. Turpin claimed that he'd been under the impression that his manager had deducted tax owed before paying him. That was deemed not to have been the case, and he was held to be personally responsible for paying the tax owed. Gordon Williams, he asked George Middleton what happened, and his response was, he didn't listen. Money was just to be spent, like he was spending it. There isn't much more I can tell you except that he was a playboy. He didn't realise that he had to pay his income tax. Now Randolph claimed to the Inland Revenue that he had never been in receipt of the full amount of money it was alleged he had earned during his career, which again was rejected by the Inland Revenue. His depression was beginning to get worse until help came from a close associate. His accountant, Max Mitchell, made an emotional plea 
to the revenue, claiming, in his words, as time goes on, the punching power of a boxer is enfeebled. The longer he pursues his profession, his brain, through constant pummeling, is numbed. His eyes are affected, deafness overtakes him, and in effect, he is lucky that in the prime of his manhood, he doesn't turn into a two-legged vegetable. And yet no allowance is given to a boxer by the Inland Revenue for the inevitable, remorseless wasting away he undergoes because of the exacting nature of his profession. Is that fair? Therefore, I claim that my client's expenses should be allowed, although estimated in view of the tax advantages allowed to industrialists. That's a absolute great rally cry, isn't it, from, from wow. Mitchell there? I think Max Mitchell's really sort of nailed it on the head with that type of a rally cry. Uh, very well worded as well. I mean, reading that quote out, it, it kind of made me feel like I was the one putting that plea forward for Randy Turpin at this point in time. But it's true. Everything he's saying about Randy Turpin, about boxers, is true. Yep, absolutely. And, and he, he even goes on to say, and the fact was when he found the records, he said he was just like a, a one in a million, Randy Turpin, because you just couldn't, because the amount of money he gave away and the amount of money he spent on drinking girls, um, you know, he was just he was handing money to everybody. And he was like, you just couldn't keep a benchmark on it. So that was the last rally cry. And I'll tell you what, beautifully put, really was fantastic. And and as a result of Max Mitchell's appeal, the tax bill was actually reduced to 17,126. I mean, wow, great work. However, Turpin, well, he was only in the possession of 1,204 pound at this time i mean f- talking about f- what three hundred thousand quid in that uh, in those days equivalent to four million over the span of his career and he's got just over a grand in his account incredible he was declared bankrupt for the remainder of the fifteen thousand nine hundred twenty-two in 1962 he told a report oh, i don't know why i'm here i did not have the money i spent it myself it was just gone he told his wife gwen that he actually paid his accountant and George Middleton his taxes and that he should never have been in debt to the inland revenue. In the end, he was ordered to pay £2 a week towards clearing his debt and was finally discharged from bankruptcy in uh, 1965. Unfortunately for Randolph, he didn't learn from his mistakes and he failed to pay his taxes again while earning as a wrestler. Uh, a demand of £800 in unpaid tax was received from the um, Inland Revenue once again. Uh, having spent all his money on drink women and giving it away, he was in danger of becoming bankrupt for a second time. It's incredible. This, the cafe was uh, now only the only source of his income and his depression, again, was getting worse. He took his depression to his uh, personal doctor who diagnosed him as punch drunk and author John Plimmer summed up Randolph's situation quite perfectly. The Titan, who had outfought and outboxed one of the greatest fighters of all time, Sugar Ray Robinson, had been the recipient of accolades and congratulations from all over the world, had been replaced by a broken and disillusioned individual with, with a mental condition, aggravated further by anger and despondency. His sister Joan said, I think he thought that everyone had abandoned him. We never went to the cafe because we weren't welcome. I went two or three times and I was made to feel very, very uncomfortable. And his older sister, Catherine, the one who doesn't beat around the bush, she's one that she's my favorite. I went into the cafe one day. He gave me a cup of tea and asked me for some money, but I wouldn't give it to him. So he slung me out. And I told him to stick his cafe up his ass and his tea. <laughs> that's the best way to to deal with that, isn't it? That's, I think how most oh, people I love would. Um, that's how that's how most people would deal with it, even in this day and age. But yeah, you're very right. If he's if he's obviously making his his sisters feel that way, uh, probably because of his depression, probably because he's got CTE as well, which was obviously yep. years and years and years away from being even mentioned. Yeah, there's a lot going on there. There's a lot going on. Depression, going out, getting pissed all the time fooling around with women, it's probably all part of the depression. It's probably the only way he he escapes, and, and that's his reality at the time, surely. I think anybody who suffered with it will probably relate to certain actions and the consequences of them actions, and I think Randy Turpin was certainly at that point here. Now, down on his luck, 
and no contact with his brothers and sisters, he was persuaded by his mate Mosh to start reclaiming the money he had borrowed out over the years and he said, Together, we made up a list of all the people that owed him money. We went to Birmingham after one fella got to his cafe and it was packed. He ushered us into a room and we started talking and he said that half of his business didn't belong to him. Mosh said that Randolph was beginning to feel restless and he wanted to kick the guy's head in, but he managed to keep his calm and they agreed for the fella to pay £5 a month to Gwen. Mosh didn't mention how many other guys they went to visit on that list, but it was Gordon Williams again who began to piece this puzzle together in his documentary, and he said, something didn't tie up. The money on ring earnings of £133,000, Randolph had paid £50,000 in tax, so why did the Inland Revenue ask for another £100,000? unless they suspected the existence of a second hidden fortune. Now, Joan had told Gordon about £17,000 in cash. She then went on to say that they went to America and made some sort of a film out there. The money that they got for that, I was given to look after. Gordon asked George Middleton about the film rights and the possibility of Randolph having extra money that he did not pay tax for, and George admitted a man gave his information to the tax people. But I shouldn't even mention that. The bottom line was that Randolph was grasped up by someone about some hidden money. Most of, of that was either lent out or asked to hold for him. And he never claimed that money back. So obviously, George, well, George basically, he wouldn't say, he wouldn't say who grasped Randolph up. But, but Gordon Williams, you know, he heard of a story through the grapevine about Randolph Turpin getting beaten up and told to keep his mouth shut about money. Now, at the time... He, as in Randolph, had brushed it off, telling people that it must have been uh, fans who were taking a disliking to him following one of the wrestling contests. Along with Gordon Williams, another man, there was another chap, uh, as we mentioned earlier, who tried to tell the truth about Randolph Turpin, Jack Burtley. And he was the author of, of another book and also a local reporter at the time. And he came across some resistance when he released his book, and when investigating the story, he said, and this is his own words, he said, maybe some of the people I approached were feeling a bit guilty or maybe thinking they were going to have the finger, point, the finger of suspicion pointed at them because it was an open secret that Turpin had been exploited. He had a staggering amount of money throughout his career and he ended up a broken man. So when someone comes along and says they want to tell a story of Randolph Turpin, these people are thinking that he's going to say, I did this and that. Maybe the family had nothing to worry about. Maybe his associates had nothing to worry about, but they didn't want to risk it. Now, Bertley didn't just encounter difficulties in getting the tr getting to the truth about what went wrong in Randy's life. He also had to deal with threats from some people who never wanted the truth to be published. And Bertley spoke of one encounter that caused him some real concern and reconsideration about publishing his book at all. And he said, when I went to visit one person who I'm not going to name, I was told without missing any words, if that book came out, I would be dead. He told me that if that book was published, it would be a widow who would be withdrawing my royalties. So wow. if you thought for one minute, that he didn't have some enemies or some people didn't want certain things coming out. I think he's the, that, that, that is the proof in the pudding. Oh God, are we putting ourselves at risk here by doing this? <laughs> I'm telling you now, all the, all these years later, all these years later. I and think, Sean, I think, I think they're all dead now, mate. I'm hoping so anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it, it's the thing is we, we, we're coming towards the end of this story. We've got a few more, a few more incidents to run through. But at the end of, of this episode, as always, you know, you guys are always left to make your own judgments about what you think happened and who you think did what. I think that's the way we've always ran it. So we're going to continue to run with the facts and the information that we've got. And, and you guys, of course, can have your your own interpretations of this. And we, we've got ours and we will give ours to you at the end as well. So moving back to Gordon Williams. Now, he had a typed letter in his possession that was written two years previously on Wednesday, March the 9th, 1964, at 9.11pm, by Turpin himself. And in that letter, he reported, Today I feel so depressed and low on spirits that I must write down what is worrying me and why. 
Well, it happens that it's been in my mind since I was sent the bankruptcy note by the government for £15,000, which I proved that I never received and proved this to the official receiver and bankruptcy, Mr Davis, but I'm having to pay this back at £2 a week, which I cannot afford to pay. It's absolutely driving me out of my mind. So if I should take my own life, or should it be done by associates of Mr J Solomons, who I think would be in touch with a certain body in London who would do away with folks who they don't wish to talk. But I have told both parties concerned that death doesn't frighten me anymore. So they have included my wife and three children in their threats. No, I am not an unbalanced man. On the contrary, I am perfectly sane. But no, these people are closing in on me and I have already made three attempts on my life, but failed. Now on May the 17th, 1966, at the young age of 37 years old, Randolph Turpin was found dead from gunshot wounds in the flat above the transport cafe. Surprisingly, his 17-month-old daughter, Carmen, was discovered next to her father, having also sustained two bullet wounds. It was assumed that Randolph had shot her before taking his own life. She was immediately rushed to hospital, where she eventually made a full recovery. Wow, what a what a compelling end. What a what a bizarre, bizarre ending for Randy Turpin. After reading that letter, in his words, and, and they were his words by the way, that was not me mispronouncing anything, that was the way he writ that letter. And it sounds a bit rushed, it sounds a bit like He's in different mind frames in two parts of the latter. The first part seems like it's more about, you know, how he is struggling with the bankruptcy. And the second part is about how it's all about he's going to get a hit on him or how he's going to try and take his life or he's tried to take his life three times. It's a very confusing letter when you go through it again. But one thing's for sure, Randy Turpin was found dead. On May the 17th, 1966, at 37, with gunshot wounds, and his daughter next to him. What a bizarre, bizarre ending for Andy Turpin. I think the the, the problem is here is that the fact that his daughter was 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 shot, you know, 17-month daughter shot. I mean, you, you bear to think. I mean, it's, it's, it's just insane. I'll tell you what, we'll, we'll move on and then we'll, we'll talk about it after. But that is a very puzzling letter as well, which uh, Gordon Williams wrote out and, you know, we've put it down. And Sean read it out. So um, it is. it does feel like a little bit out there and a bit up and down, doesn't it, Randolph? I think he was looking out over his shoulder at times. Whether he was justified or not, well, we, we, we can make our own minds on that. And Well, considering Turpin was known uh, to dote on his youngest daughter, it has remained a complete mis- mystery since why he should have attempted to take her life as well as his own. One bullet actually entered his head and it actually lodged against his skull without entering his brain. Now, I've done a bit of research and I can say that if you shoot yourself in the head, even if it doesn't penetrate your brain, you're very, very likely to be unconscious. Very, very likely. So if he shot himself in his head, he's going to be unconscious. How has he managed to then shoot himself a second time in the heart, which penetrated his heart, and that was the wound that actually killed him. That is where I'm a bit sceptical with it. I mean, I do love a conspiracy, but it just seems a bit crazy that you'd shoot yourself in the head after shooting your your young baby daughter and then shoot yourself in the heart after waking up from concussion. It just, it just beggars belief. How he could even do that, I don't know. Well, his wife, Gwen, she said uh, she was in the house, you know, it was the morning, and it was a normal day. He got up and he saw the three older kids off to school. He actually had a letter. He received a letter from his mother that morning. And she said, I thought that he was just replying to the letter because he sat for quite a while writing. I think it was about one o'clock because the girls had come back from school and he went upstairs. He seemed to be a long time not coming down. So I went upstairs and that's how we found him. Now, a suicide note was found pinned on the door of the room where his dead body was found, instructing Gwen to not give anything to any of his brothers or sisters. And emotionally suggesting that she should go back to Wales, where the couple had uh, been their happiest. 
Now, at the inquest that followed, it was confirmed that Randolph Turpin had committed suicide, although some members of his family believed that he had, in fact, been murdered and that his killer or killers had made the incident look like a suicide. There were also many others who agreed with that conclusion. Although there are no official inquiry into that death. I mean, the coroner was pretty clear, open, shut. He killed, he tried to kill his daughter and he's killed himself. That's what they said. There were some unusual factors that might have supported the Turpin's family suspicions. The fact that he shot himself in the head and then shot himself. I mean, it, it all seems a little bit out there that someone would do that to themselves. I don't know. What do you think, mate? I mean, we, we speak about it after, sure, but it does seem a bit crazy, doesn't it? Well, interestingly, the circumstances of the suicide were a lot like those surrounding the alleged suicide, or, well, it was a confirmed suicide, but, you know, alleged in, in different respects, of Freddie Mills on July the 25th, 1965. We did that for our first series of The Darker Side of Boxing. Uh, there are more details surrounding Freddie Mills' death, more more specific details surrounding that than there is for Randy Turpin's. Now, due to the circumstances behind the death, Turpin becomes somewhat of a forgotten hero, but was actually inducted as a member of the International Boxing Hall of Fame in Canastota, New York in 2001. And there is a statue of him in Market Square, Warwick. On his headstone, it states that he was 38 when he died, but he was actually 37, as he was 20 days short of his 38th birthday. At his funeral, the Reverend Eugene Hazelden said, At the height of his career, Randolph was surrounded by those who regarded themselves as friends and well-wishers, but he was deserted by many as he lost his position, and money. The fickleness of his friends and the incompetent advice must have weighed so heavily upon him that he was forced to desperation. Randolph was a simple man, a naive man, and he needed friends to protect him from the sponges. To our shame, he was let down. The tragedy is not his failure alone, but the failure of our whole society. Now following his comeback after the loss to Gordon Wallace, Turpin actually wrote a poem titled The Comeback Road and the final verse of which is as follows and it says So we leave this game which was hard and cruel and down at the show on a ringside stool we'll watch the next man just one more fool. Brilliant poem. Love that. Great way to end it. But I suppose the, the, um, it's so tricky this one. I mean I, there isn't as much when you think about the whole Randolph Turpin story, you know, when you think of darker side of boxing, I mean, it ends in tragedy. It starts in tragedy, ends in tra tragedy, and you have sort of nice bits in the middle with these hangers on. A and the fact that, you know, he was clearly depressed and um, the, the injuries he sustained in the ring clearly affected him. I'm, I'm intrigued to know what your thoughts are, Sean. How do, do, you, do you believe, was this a murder or was it suicide? I think there's a lot more evidence pointing towards suicide to me. On this occasion, yeah. uh, I mean, obviously we did Freddie Mills' story and I, the reason I go back to that is because there are a lot more information out there, a lot more evidence, a lot more investigations were done because of the way he was found, uh, the way things were specifically placed in the car that he was found in. Uh, there was a lot more around that, whereas this seemed to be more of an open shut case and you look at his whole life and, and, and his career inside and outside of the ring and you look at the fact that it was quite evident from all accounts, from the people that were spoken to, his family members, his friends, even his manager, that there were a lot of periods of time in his life that he was depressed. And that depression will have never have been dealt with correctly. He would have mentally been in a certain state for a very long time, I think. And I, I genuinely, reading that letter back, it, some of it doesn't make sense to me. Some of it feels like it's all over the show. And that could that be, you know, could that be consistent with somebody who is... He's struggling that badly. I think it could be. I think it could be evidence there straight away that he's he's struggling. He's in his own mind. He's already suggesting that he thinks someone was going to come out to get him and someone was going to kill him and that he wasn't stupid and that he was not afraid of death. And the fact that early on in his life, just randomly, he tried to commit suicide, drinking the disinfectant. I think mm. he had mental issues for a very long time. Uh, that's what I think. Um, I could be totally wrong. We're never going to know, but that's the thing. I think it's open to interpretation. For me personally, Johnston, I think going through the story, going through certain 
key moments in his life, it feels like he was he was depressed for a very long time. He was in a certain mental state of mind. I, I think he genuinely he genuinely did do what he did. I think he did commit suicide. I think he probably because he doted on his daughter so much, he probably wanted to take her with him because he loved her that much. It, it, this has happened before in in recent times, in recent memories for us. We've we've seen it happen before. Someone in that mental state of mind probably wouldn't think twice about about killing their daughter and then taking their own life. So I I don't really think there's enough evidence to suggest that there's, there's foul play. I know there's one theory that you've mentioned earlier that I know you're going to speak about in a minute. And obviously I'll let you put that out there for people to make their own mind upon. But for me, I think it is pretty much open shut. I think he was depressed. I think he a lot of things were going on. I think he decided to end his life. And that was a sad ending for such a, a brilliant fighter, such a great fighter that had so many great accolades. And the biggest one of all was beating Sugar Ray Robinson. Oh, mate, he was... Um superstar wasn't he and he, he literally went from hero to zero and, and he did just um it, it, it's, it's, it's evident from from a very young age you know the fact that he tried to commit suicide clearly it, it was ruled as you know the, the fact you can't commit suicide it's crazy like it was against the law to commit suicide so if you fail in your attempt you can get actually done for it which isn't going to help your mentality is it uh it's just a strange fucking law uh of those days the stupid things you hear it just it, it makes you laugh because it's just absolutely ridiculous but yeah i mean look, there was there was clearly issues it even says i tried to commit try to commit suicide three times i mean the, sometimes they're a cry for help though these suicide i mean i've heard it several times where people never they they, they know they're not going to be successful and they deliberately do it there's there's a few questions for me the fact is is that his wife's in the house you know she's not in the house she's in the cafe because it's in the cafe so she's in the cafe downstairs i know there's a lot of hustle and bustle in the cafe a lot of cups and glasses and cutlery being scattered around when it's when it's in full use but to not hear what three gunshots from downstairs is suspicious to me i don't understand how you can't hear three gunshots you would hear three gunshots surely at some point for her to then just to go upstairs just on the off we ain't been down for a while and and he's dead with uh with the with the baby daughter shot is just it just doesn't it just doesn't sit right in my head so that's where i think that there's there's, there's an element there where as someone coming with a sniper not a sniper or, or not even a sniper or a, like a silencer sorry uh you know that is a possibility it, you know they used to use the pillows there's, there's there's nothing there when you when you try and find coroner report there's just nothing it's just the coroner's like it's, it's, it's a suicide it doesn't even mention the gun where was the gun what gun was it there's there's nothing there Whereas with Freddie Mills, there's so much more information. And why is that? That's what I don't understand. What is what is there to do with Randy Turpin that is just like there's less information? I don't understand that. You know, we're talking 10 months, 10 months earlier, Freddie Mills is being murdered by the mob. Clearly for me, I think that was definitely not a suicide. I think he was definitely killed. More's come out of that. Uh, but I, I just think if you shoot yourself in the head, the chances of you, even if it doesn't kill you, being able to continue it and shoot yourself in the heart, just, just it just doesn't work for me. I, I don't get that. So, you know, what he shoots himself, he shoots his daughter, shoots himself in his head, he's concussed and then eventually wakes up and shoots himself in the heart. I just, that doesn't sit right. And how no one can hear the gunshots. I just think there's too much there for it to not have happened. And I think because of the Freddie Mills thing and because of the fact that he was unbalanced as in Randy Turpin, he was saying certain things, he's writing letters, he's feeling like he needs to look over his shoulder. I know he's depressed, I know he's not well, but I still think that there's something not right. I, I just generally believe it, honestly. I, I, I'm not 100% going to say it was suicide. I'm not saying it wasn't, but I think there's still an element that he could have been murdered. I think you've got to also look at the, the book that Jack Burley released, uh, years later, uh, years obviously years and years ago for us now. But when he when he was in the process of writing that book, the fact that he mentions he was threatened with death yep. if he was to release yep. certain information within that book, I mean, is is that just something he said to beef up? You know, the fact that that book then becomes more of a must buy book because then people want to know why that happened. You know, in the interview, does that mean people will have went out after that interview and gone, Oh, actually, I want to read that book. Why, why is it so? I mean, that, that's what's happened. Yeah, people do beef, true. people do beef these things up or is it true? Is it true that, you know, he was threatened? Is it true that he was potentially going to expose some information that could have implicated certain individuals? 
around Randy Turpin. That could have meant these guys are actually fleecing him of all this money. That 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 it, it seems quite evident that that did happen. I mean, there's no foregone conclusion with all that. A lot of it is based on people who were around at the time, and it's and it's their stories and it's their recollections of this. And we know how recollections can be twisted over the years. So you you genuinely just don't don't know a hundred percent, but. There's a lot of other surrounding details which you could easily interpret in a different way. And even you mentioning about the manner of his death, uh, how how could he have shot himself in the heart after shooting himself in the head? I think a crime scene investigator would be the best person to answer that. But then again, are there any evidence of the crime scene? Is there anything out there? You obviously... Uh, I've, I've, I've tried to look we've tried to look if there's anything but there's absolutely nothing i bet if you went into a public library locally might possibly find some information there i think it's very limited very very limited uh so i don't think we'll ever know the true answer to that i think the evidence makes me feel it was a foregone conclusion of suicide and i think bringing the other information to light is only fair and only right and i think anybody that wants to interpret this in a different way i'd be interested to hear if you had any other theories or whether there is any information that we've overlooked in in putting this episode together but for me it's a sad story really because we've covered a lot of his a lot of his boxing career we've covered a lot of the goings on outside of the ring the failed business of the cafe the failed second business the inland revenue issues it it starts off so well it gets to a pinnacle winning the world title from Sugar Ray Robinson and it's like as soon as you get to that top of that mountain there's only one place you can go and that's down again and that's exactly where he went he plummeted right down like you said he went from a hero to a zero and and yet there's a lot of people that I don't so much think they've forgotten about Randy Turpin as a fighter there's a lot of boxing historians that appreciate what he was but then I think there's a story here that needed to be told again once more about a, a man who came from obscurity to the top of the mountain and fell from grace so quickly and was probably misguided, misinformed, uh, slightly uneducated, wasn't given enough support and was just generally fleeced for everything that he had and was was left to really living the consequences of of what was a really tough boxing career successful one but a tough one and left him with with loads of lasting issues and cte was clearly one of them cte could have been the predominant reason why he killed himself there's there's a lot a lot of things that you can take from this there is a lot of things you can take away from it but i suppose for, for for you guys listening it's down to you as to what you interpret to be the true story surrounding it is it an open shut case or is there more to it what do you think ultimately, Johnston, about Randy Turpin then and about his life well, and his story? There was something I was going to put in and um, I was, you know, I just thought, I don't know why I didn't really do it, but I've just, I, I want to mention anyway, but it was Turpin's family doctor, the one that said that he was punch drunk. He, 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 I'm going to just read out what he says. So he says, in my opinion, boxing was actually responsible for his death. His theory was that years of injuries in the ring had left Turpin with permanent brain damage. And now the autopsy reported no such damage as well which is interesting but again it's different back then wasn't it I I don't think the technology was quite there the circumstantial evidence for the doctor's theory was considerable Turpin certainly had received violent blows to the head over the course of his career from an unlucky encounter with a brick in the early days to a right hand punch that knocked him in the 10th uh, three second match with Robinson by the end of his life friends had noticed changes in his mood and behaviour misalignment in his eyes and an ongoing lack of energy, all suggesting the presence of traumatic brain injury, the kind impossible to detect in a standard autopsy. Unfortunately, nobody ever bothered to do the microscopic testing necessary to confirm such damage and Turpin's brain remains a mystery. So I thought you just mentioned in CTE, I think that's definitely why um, I just thought I'd just throw that in because I I was going to put it in and I've just got to say it. So that was the family doctor's opinion and Look, he had problems. I don't, there's no doubt about it. Yeah, he was suffering depression. He definitely had something wrong. I mean, how they could say that he, there was no such damage to the brain. Again, was the coroner, did he do a proper thorough investigation? I don't think he did. I think that's that's where it, I just don't get it. Maybe, maybe he couldn't do it because obviously there was a bullet wedged in his head. I don't, I don't know. Well, for me, Johnson, I've enjoyed sitting down to go through 
a lot of the trials and tribulations of, of Randy's life and his career. And it sounds like he was an absolute character and a character that has, would have yeah. thrived in this generation and would have thrived in, in this particular era uh, and would have been one of one of them greats that would have been able to do have done so much more in his career, poss- quite possibly. But for me, if you look at some of his accolades, you know, winning the titles in the middleweight and light heavyweight division on the domestic scene, the British uh, Commonwealth light heavyweight middleweight titles, the world middleweight title from the best, the pound for pound best fighter of all time. Do you know, for me, that deserves praise of the highest form. And it has been very much like a little bit of a career profile mixed into the, the true crime aspect of Randy Turpin's life, really. And, and I've thoroughly enjoyed going through it. And I hope you guys listening, I hope you've enjoyed it. I hope you've enjoyed listening to the story of Randolph Turpin, his boxing career, as, as brief as it probably was in terms of what we put into this episode. And I hope you've enjoyed listening to the aspects of his career that, that, that sent him on that downward spiral that ultimately led to him taking his life and the, the sad ending to what could have been so much more for him. He's, he was 37 years of age when he died. There's it's, it's no age. There's no age to die. He could have done so much more, not so much in a boxing ring, but he could have done so much more for boxing. He could have had more help as the years went by. We, there's just so many things that, could have happened and probably should have happened before he died, as we've quite evidently found out with his story. But I, I've enjoyed going through. I've enjoyed bringing Randy Turpin to the forefront, even though some of it is quite sad. I, I'm glad to be able to talk about a lot of his boxing career and a lot of the impact that he had in a boxing ring and the legacy that he left in a boxing ring is is what I will always take away from his story. Not so much the the sad ending really uh, it is sad but I, I more look at his boxing career I more look at his accolades I remember him that way uh, and I'll always remember Randy Turpin as the guy that beat Sugar Ray Robinson uh, and I hope everybody's enjoyed listening to it Johnston any any final thoughts before we wrap this up yeah just to echo what you said I mean what he's an absolute great for me I mean he, he goes down as one of the greatest British fighters of all time and and he had power in both hands he was an absolute beast at middleweight absolute base i don't think i think it gets overlooked and because the footage is limited you know you're, you're going on with pulse but from what some of the knockouts and some of the guys he bulldozed over very easily and the fact that he beat sugar ray robinson and even in that second fight give him all sorts of problems if if ruby goldstein had an of uh i think he, he he had been in the ring when someone had died just previously before that i think that's probably half the reason why he decided to then pull the plug on that fight as early as he did. If he hadn't, he may well have sought that fight on cuts and then you'd be talking about a different Randy Turpin beating Sugar Ray twice, which would have been incredible. Um, so, you know, it's it's just how it works out. And the fact that Ray, Ray Robinson wouldn't give him a third fight, you know, the one one each, he should have given the trilogy. He did with other fighters. He weren't interested in doing it with Randy Turpin. That says a lot about Randolph Turpin, how much of a, a fantastic fighter he was. I do sort of you know there was there wasn't enough evidence as well in terms of those little domestic violences and problems he had with other his allegations against his other women so i think he was a bit heavy-handed which obviously is a result of his mental issues as well ah i mean you got you can't help but just have to if anything ruined his life it was boxing that although it made him a hero and turned and it just completely turned his back on him but boxing probably it was the result on why Randy fell to pieces in the end. And that was what makes it a sad story because we love boxing. And, and back then, boxing was horrible to guys like this. It really was. It certainly took more from him than he took from it. Yeah. That is the, the, the final statement I'll probably make about it. And it sums it up, really, about Randy Turpin's life and career. It's been great. I've enjoyed doing the episode. I've enjoyed sitting down to go through Randy Turpin's life, his, his sad ending, his boxing career. It's been brilliant. And I hope you guys have enjoyed it. If you have... Make sure you drop us a tweet at darker underscore side underscore pod on Twitter. You can find us at the BTR Boxing Podcast Network on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube also. Please do go and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you've not checked out our Patreon service, please do go and check it out. Patreon.com forward slash BTR boxing podcast network. You will get access to episodes earlier than the rest of the world. So please do and go with check that out and check out all the other content that is available that also hasn't been released to the general public but for everybody else of course who are not patrons 
Thank you for listening. Thank you for your support. Make sure you share this episode on social media, whether it be Facebook, whether it be Instagram, whether it be Twitter. Make sure you do it. Get it shared out there. Let's get people's opinions about Randy Turpin, his successes in the ring, what you think about the ending of his life, whether it was an open and shut case or whether you think there's foul play here. Please do go and let us know. It's been a pleasure speaking to you about the episode, the tragedy of Randy Turpin.